My name is Monica Yearwood. I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner, and this is about a 45 minute long presentation on some of my favorite Ayurvedic methods for cleansing both the body and the mind. This is an interactive presentation, so you want to grab a pad of paper and a pen as I'll be guiding you through several self assessment practices that will help you to identify any toxins in your body and your mind, as well as how to identify which cleanse methods are best for you to use to treat yourself at this time. In this 45 minute long presentation, you're going to learn what a toxin is exactly from an Ayurvedic perspective, the role of digestion in Ayurvedic cleansing, what distinguishes an Ayurvedic cleanse from all the different types of cleanses that are out there, and which methods you should choose to help you bring into alignment your best self in both body and in mind. So to begin, we're gonna use about a 90 second long meditation practice. You're gonna close your right nostril with your thumb and bring your pointer and middle finger to the forehead. And you're gonna breathe in and out of the left nostril only for about 10 breaths. Just allow yourself to breathe easily and naturally. Don't force the breath or try to control it by any means. Just allow your body to breathe as it wants to in this moment. You can lower your right hand down to your left. Breathe easily through both nostrils. Observe the overall quality of your breathing right now. Is your breath easy or is it tight and restricted? Allow it to be what it is and simply observe. You're going to bring your left thumb up to the left nostril, pointer and middle finger to the forehead, and we're going to breathe in and out of the right nostril only for about 10 breaths. Lower your left hand down to your left knee and breathe easily. Great. Thank you for meditating with me. So why do we meditate? Well, there's a few reasons. With that particular practice, we can use it to help with um, calming the nervous system and relaxing the mind. So breathing in and out of the right and the left nostril for equal amounts of time helps to pacify the nervous system as well as balance the right and left hemispheres of the brain. But most importantly, the reason why we meditate and include breathing practices into our daily regimen is that Ayurveda, which is yoga sister science, teaches that each one of us is endowed with an inner knower who is empowered intuitively to make the best choices and decisions for us in regard to every realm of our life. So our relationships, our diet, etc. But sometimes access to this inner knower is marred by debris in the mind. Um, this swirling debris in the mind is called vrittis in yoga and in Ayurveda. And it can block access to the inner knower and to our intuition. So meditation helps to calm the swirling debris of the mind so that access to this 
inner knower is much more accessible. And in so making this connection on a regular basis, we start to really understand and operate in alignment with our best needs in all realms of life on a more consistent basis. So it's the first step in detoxifying the mind. Which leads me to our first introduction into this course, which is what is a toxin to begin with? We're hearing the word toxin more and more frequently in mainstream culture. Um, there are juiceries and different cleanse and detox clinics and programs and classes and products perhaps more so than ever in our lifetime. And so a lot of us think that this is like a, a new fad type situation, but it's actually not. Cleansing the body uh, is very old. In fact, Ayurvedic medicine is over 5,000 years old, and it has one of the most evolved um, cleansing methodologies known in natural medicine, which is called Panchakarma, which we'll talk about that in a little bit. But even the Ayurvedic lifestyle practices help with cleansing and detoxifying on a daily basis. And those are really the focal point in what we're going to talk about in this course. So what is the toxin and what is it that we're really trying to cleanse from the body? Well, there are many different types of toxins. We have external toxins that are um, introduced to our body that come through our environment. One of the most... Um, one of the ones that I tend to think about quite readily are xenoestrogens. And xenoestrogens are hormonal disruptors and they're byproducts from plastic production. And so you can ingest xenoestrogens, unfortunately, if you consume certain types of plastics and they also leach out in our water streams and systems, etc. Xenoestrogens are endocrine disruptors. And what they do is mimic estrogen in the body and unfortunately, excess estrogen in the body can lead to many different types of estrogen-dependent cancers like breast and uterine cancers. Or it can also lead to the development of uterine fibroids and other problems. So we have external um, toxins that can be introduced to the body and disrupt the body's normal functioning. We also have internal toxins, so toxins that we actually consume. And one of the most um, common ones that I think of is carrageenan. Carrageenan is an additive that's used as a thickening agent in many different types of foods. Um, even natural and organic foods, you'll see carrageenan added to it, like soy milks and almond milks, um, ice creams, pie crusts, pie fillings, and many other different types of products. Carrageenan is extracted from seaweed, and it was originally used because of its ability to cause isolated inflammation in muscle cells in um, laboratory test, testing on animals. So that's how carrageenan first came about before it became a food additive. Um, so unfortunately, people with different types of inflammatory disorders like rheumatoid arthritis or um, inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and colitis tend to hyper-react to the carrageenan that's added into our foods. So there's another example of toxin that we um, take internally. There are toxins also that the body produces, um, and we'll get into this in a little bit. It relates to how we digest. So Ayurveda teaches that if our digestion is not functioning at the most optimal level, that no matter what we eat, we will produce toxicity, internal toxicity in the body. We have um, emotional toxins. Um, so these toxins can be uh, formed from unhealthy relationships or dysfunctional relationships or relationships that are chronically stressed can produce emotional toxins. And we also have different types of mental toxins. So this really takes us to our first assessment. Um, and so Looking at this sheet, you'll see four different categories, or excuse me, three different categories of toxins. We have the emotional category, we have the mental category, and we have the physical category. So using your pen and your paper, if you'd like to, you can just do a self-inquiry and self-assessment and see if you notice 
any of these toxins are um, present in your body and your mind. Emotional toxins include things like resentment, anger, irritability, depression, grief, and sadness. A lot of these emotions are normal emotions, so I don't want to give the impression that anger in and of itself is a toxin. Sometimes anger is a very natural and normal human response to certain situations that we may come across in our life. And anger can even serve to protect us or move us out of dangerous situations. But when anger becomes toxic is when anger is something that's chronically experienced. So it's something that's chronic, then it can start to wreak, wreak havoc on the body. And this is documented. It influences our physiological processes, including how cortisol is secreted, etc. Um, or when anger is not appropriately directed out. So when we can't use anger constructively somehow in, in our lives, and it turns in on of ourselves and are in on ourselves, and when we start to really internalize anger, so when it becomes a chronic condition. We have mental toxins, and so this really kind of includes like the overall quality of our mind on a continual basis. Obviously, if every once in a while we experience a foggy mind or an irritated mind, this is just you know natural. Um, and actually, it could be a byproduct of detoxification, too. But again, we're really looking at the regularity and the um, and if these things are, are kind of like a chronic state of mind. So if the mind is chronically foggy, if you chronically have racing thoughts, the inability to sit still, that kind of um, refers to just always having to be immersed in activity, like avoiding your thoughts, avoiding what you're thinking about, uh, memory problems, so not being able to access information very well, and difficulty concentrating. Those um, altogether refer to mental toxins. There are many more symptoms associated with toxicity in the physical body, but these are the most common ones. Um, bacterial, fungal, or microbial imbalance, difficulty with losing weight, or difficulty with maintaining weight. So being underweight and trying to gain weight can also be a symptom of toxicity. Blood sugar resistance, chronic nausea, chronic mucus production in the body, which can be a response to inflammation, um, excess weight, water retention, uncontrollable cravings for things, and chronic skin conditions, as well as swollen lymph glands. So these are all symptoms that you need to cleanse your body. But I also want to point out that Ayurveda is not a reactive system, and what I mean by that is we use cleansing when toxicity is evident, but we also use cleansing preventatively. Ayurveda teaches that we should cleanse, uh, do a deep cleanse every fall and every spring of the year at least. And we also have, and in Ayurvedic cleansing we have uh, daily cleanse practices that we use on an ongoing basis throughout the year. And we also have intensive cleansing. And we actually learn a lot about both of these practices during my, um, my four-week cleanse course program. Um, so it's a four-week detox class where you learn a lot of the Ayurvedic lifestyle practices for cleansing. And then you're also guided through a 21-day-long cleanse. So before we go any further, it's probably a good idea for me to introduce who I am. My name is Monica Yearwood. I've been an Ayurvedic practitioner uh, for the last 10 years. I work with both groups and individuals. My specialty includes Ayurvedic detoxification and cleansing, but also um, Ayurvedic lifestyle methods. I own an Ayurvedic center in Chicago um, that's three and a half years old as of today, or this day around. Um, and I also have a line of different herb, herbs and herbal oils on my sister site, Hamza Apothecary. And I have a personal blog that talks a lot about um, Ayurveda and Ayurvedic methods called monkeyearwood.com. So you can explore that too. Continuing on, why does one person become toxic and not the other person? Um, so we all know that story or that actual person who uh, lives to be 120 years old and smokes, you know, 12 cigars a day and eats uh, fast food every single day 
and um, never gets sick and is always happy and stays really strong. Um, and there's a lot of variances and the question is really kind of complex of why one person becomes toxic and why another person does not become toxic or ill related to our karma, our genetic uh, predisposition, um, lessons we're meant to learn in this lifetime, etc. But there's also one key and very important thing that is within our control um, on why one person may become toxic and not another person, and that relates to the strength of our digestion, which we very much can influence. Digestion is hugely important in Ayurvedic medicine and Ayurvedic lifestyle. In fact, all of Ayurveda's nutritional suggestions and requirements um, really address the different digestive tendencies of each person and work to strengthen the digestive tendencies of each person. Digestion is the epicenter of the immune system, so it's where all the tissue layers develop from the physical body. But Digestion does not just refer to the food that we're consuming, but we actually digest through all of our senses. So we eat what we are experiencing through our touch, through our taste, through our smell, through our sight, through our sound, so what we actually hear. And so a strong digestion refers to the ability to effectively extract the nutrient of whatever it is that we're consuming and effectively expel the waste. We become toxic when our ability to digest becomes compromised for any reason. And reasons for toxicity or reasons for compromised digestion include things like chronic stress, uh, sudden trauma, or favoring the wrong diet or wrong lifestyle practices for an extended period of time. And so in Ayurvedic cleansing, we address all of the sensory input systems. So we want to first look at what our overall digestive tendencies are. And so here's another assessment. So you could, if you want to use your pen and paper again, or just simply look at the sheet. And Ayurveda really makes four different distinguished categories of digestive type. So you want to think about your physical digestion, your mental digestion, and your emotional digestion. So with irregular digestion symptoms, which irregular digestion tends to be thought of as, as almost the worst, or yeah, the worst digestive type to almost have, um, the most toxic producing one. Um, and sometimes your digestion is regular and sometimes it's not. And it's, it's hard to identify why with this type of digestion. You could be on the same diet, nothing's changed. There's no additional emotional stressors, there's nothing, but then all of a sudden one day there's this great variance in your digestive irregularity for seemingly no rhyme or reason. There's a tendency towards being constipated with hard stools. You're frequently bloated and gassy. There's irregularity and appetite. Irritable bowel syndrome is a symptom of irregular digestion. And there's intolerance to raw vegetables. So with this type of digestion, eating a raw foods diet can be very provoking. And then we also have the mental symptoms that are associated with irregular digestion. So there's irregularity in mind. Like this person can sometimes concentrate for long periods of time, but then not concentrate for long periods of time. There may be vacillations between activities that they do. They focus on one topic, they focus on another topic. There's a lot of move, moving between. There's irregularity in mind. And then there's a lot of emotional irregularity. Sometimes there's happiness, sometimes there's sadness, but there's a sway and vacillation seemingly without a, specific, without a specific provoking factor, but just re rather this unprovoked vacillation between a wide variety of emotions. And then we have slow digestion. So with slow digestion, um, there's a feeling of being slow and sluggish. This person will be like, I don't know what it is. You know, I, I ate this meal and it feels like it took like 12 hours to go through me. Um, there's slow metabolism, there's tendency toward excess weight, there's mucus in the bowel. Um, this person has a low appetite, and despite having a low appetite and not really feeling that hungry and not eating that much, there's still a tendency to gain weight and a really, really difficult time with losing weight. The mind symptoms associated with this type. Foggy mind, resentment, and holding on are the emotional symptoms. 
Then we have sharp digestion, sharp. It's kind of a strange word, but what this really means is kind of like excess heat in digestion or really, really fast metabolizing digestion. And um, with this type, you may see periods of regular bowel movement or tendencies towards loose bowel movements, burning conditions, heartburn, diarrhea. This person may feel constantly hungry. They're always hungry. You know, they eat and then they feel hungry for an hour, an hour later. And this indicates this the excess heat in digestion. Um, all the inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's, colitis, fall underneath this category. There's a strong intolerance towards spicy foods, fried foods, and caffeine. Um, the emotional aspect of sharp digestion, irritability, chronic anger, chronic criticism, and the mental symptoms associated are passionate thoughts. So wanting, desire, and strong desire um, are symptoms of sharp digestion. Then we have the balanced digestive type in which we are all striving for, which is you know well bowel, um, formed bowel movements daily at least once a day, six to 12 inches of length, banana shaped, no strong cravings, um, satisfied with food choices, there are no uh, pronounced food intolerances, and balanced digestion in mind, accurate perception in life, and a feeling of continuous contentment. So now that you know what your digestive tendency is, we're going to go into what distinguishes an Ayurvedic cleanse. So there are four features of what really distinguishes an Ayurvedic cleanse from many of the Ayurvedic cleanse methods that are out there. One is the role of the senses, which we talked about a little bit before. The actual methods that are used in Ayurvedic cleansing. The actual diet that is used in Ayurvedic cleansing. And the doshas. So now we'll explore these in a little bit more in depth. So right away, we're going to come to the assessment and we're going to examine the senses. As we talked about before, we consume through all of our senses. Everything that we're experiencing is essentially a food. Who we are is a byproduct of what we eat. You've heard the saying, we are what we eat. Not just food, but everything that we experience. So this is, assessment is really more of a question. And I would like you just to write down sight, sound, smell, feel, and taste and do an inventory over the last 24 hours and look at what you have eaten through all of your senses. I'd like you to ask yourself the question if any of what thing of what you're eating, so perhaps you're listening to really angry music, are you watching a lot of violence on TV and then are you noticing that you're feeling angry or violent? Um, you know, what is it that you're you're smelling on a regular basis? What are you feeling on your body? Are you wearing comfortable clothing? What are you tasting with your mouth? And I would just like you to pose yourself the question if any of the sensory input should or could be different. And if it should or could be different, why? Moving on, this takes us into the actual methods that are used in Ayurvedic cleansing. So when we cleanse, we look at what we're inputting into our senses on a regular basis, and then we manipulate it. So we actually use the senses. During an Ayurvedic cleanse, we want to favor the sattvic quality of mind, it's called. So having a sattvic mind means that you feel peaceful, you ha feel happy, you feel contented, you have really strong discernment abilities, you can discern what's wrong and right for yourself on an ongoing basis. And so... When the, with the manipulation of our senses, we um, take more of an active role to listen to pleasant music with positive messages, you know, read things that are positive, smell things that are positive, and I think you probably get the point. So that's one method of you used in our Ayurvedic cleanse methods. And in my four-week detox class with a 21-day guided cleanse, we do a more in-depth inventory of how we use our senses and we make a much more vested effort in um, manipulating how we use our senses. The other distinguishing feature of Ayurvedic cleanse methods includes the actual the actual products that we use, basically. So we use different herbs that target different organ systems. We use um, 
boskis, which are therapeutic herbal enemas. We may use different laxatives. We use um, different medicinal oils that we use in our um, massage, self-massage practices. We use gastrointestinal tract cleansers. Um, we use different sinus oils. We have different oils for the head, for the body, and for the feet. And we choose these different Ayurvedic methods based on the person's constitution and based on their digestive type. In my 21-day uh, guided cleanse, a four-week detox class, we do different inventories to choose which methods that we need to use because we don't need to use all of these methods. We choose them based on our constitution and which toxins that we're, we're intending on eliminating. And then there's also clinical Ayurvedic detoxification practices, specifically called um, Panchakarma. And this is a classic method of cleansing where you come into an actual center and you receive treatments. And so some of the common treatments that we use are Bhutavartana, which is an herbal scrub. Abhyanga is pretty part of course, which is a massage practice that uses herbalized oil. Shirodhara, where we pour herbal oil over the third eye to cleanse the nervous system and different herbal steam practices. And those are just really a handful. We have many more different Ayurvedic treatments that we use for cleansing and detoxification. Our dietary practices during cleansing, again, chosen specifically for the individual based on their digestive type. And we also have different modern considerations that many Ayurvedic practitioners, including myself, take into consideration when we're developing a dietary system for people. Um, mainstay in modern Ayurveda, there's a lot of use of grains and legumes. Um, grains and legumes are sometimes foreign entities to be eating in such a heavy or regular amount for people that are of different ancestral lineages, um, like European, certain European lineages don't really eat a lot of beans and grains, so those can be actually more difficult to digest. And so certain modifications need to be made um, instead of just eating, you know, kitchari, which is an Ayurvedic soup for cleansing and detoxifying the body. And so we take all that into consideration, but really the main point of diet in Ayurveda during cleansing is one, to look at the individual mind body type of the person, and that includes their ancestral lineage, and then favoring a diet that is very easy to digest um, and is liquid based as well as low calorie. So that could be different types of soups or juices or even smoothies given the right um, situation and constitutional type. Finally, one of the finer distinguishing attributes of Ayurvedic cleansing is a look at what is called the doshas, the different doshic types. So like Chinese medicine, Ayurveda uh, looks at everything in the universe as being made up of these five different elements, air, ether, fire, water, and earth. The human being is a small model of the universe. So what we can observe in nature, we can also observe within the human body. For example, water. We can see water, rain, lakes, rivers, streams. We can see water within the physical body via our tears, our sweat, our urine, our lymph, our synovial fluid, the mucus in our body. So that's just one example of the five elements. Um, and what actually binds the elements together into the physical human body are the three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha. Vata is air and ether, pitta is fire and water, and kapha is earth and water. Um, I'm going to tell you how to identify the current balance of the doshas within your own constitution. Most people really understand the doshas or attribute the doshas to the mind-body types in Ayurveda. So what's your dosha? What's your mind-body type? And understanding that helps us to understand the ideal lifestyle practices for us except, uh, that we need to follow and certain dietary modifications. Um, but these doshas also govern all the physiological functions in the body. And for this talk, that's really what we're going to focus on. So not really identifying what is my dosha, but rather looking at the dosha's function related to our actual physiology. Why do we need to know that? Well, with Ayurvedic cleansing, we try to address which of the three doshas is in excess in our body, and that determines the lifestyle practices or cleanse methods that we use to rid the body of the excess dosha. 
So vata is air and ether or wind. And in the physical body, it governs all movement. It, um, so just like wind in nature is always moving, it's transient, it's lighter than the earth. It, um, wind in the physical body is transient, it's always moving, it's light. There's an ethereal quality to it. We can't really see the wind when we look outside, but we can see what the wind is actually doing. And therefore, it is considered to be subtle. So same thing in the physical body. We can't actually see vata, but we can see what it's doing. We can see our blood circulation. We can see when we eat food that the food is moving down the esophagus through the GI tract. We can see um, when I'm thinking that I'm actually pulling th thoughts forward. All of that is governed by vata dosha. So when vata is in excess, we're going to see disturbances in movement. Um, we'll see uh, cravings for warmth because vata is cold, wind is cold. We may see tendencies toward being underweight. We may see abdominal distension, bloating, or constipation. Think about it. The excess of air and ether in the physical body. Um, you'll see excess gas, bloating, abdominal distension, belching is another symptom and degenerative diseases of all kinds. So if we took wind and we blew it against a rock for thousands of years, what would happen to the rock? The rock would start to break down. Same thing with the physical body when there's an excess of vata dosha. In the mind, when there's excess vata, you'll see racing thoughts. The thoughts start to speed up. Um, anxiety, worry, difficulty sleeping, and insomnia. So what to do? Ayurveda uses the application of opposites to bring balance to the body. Something is hot, we use cold. Something's wet, we use dry. Something's um, oily, we use dry again. Um, so you get you get the point. So when there is excess vata, excess wind, excess movement, cold and dryness, we'll use stability. We'll use um, warmth. We'll use something oily. So one of the best and easiest ways to reduce vata with home-based methods that you can do is by drinking oil or drinking oily substances and oiling the skin. Um, there's something called internal snehana where you take one teaspoon of ghee. If you're vegan, you can use coconut oil or almond oil and you put it in um, spiced water. What's a spiced water? It's a water that's been spiced. And there are many different types of recipes, but for the sake of this talk, a simple spiced water, just take two or three slices of raw ginger put it in a cup, top it with boiling hot water. Ginger is good for all constitutional types. And then add one teaspoon of ghee, drink it first thing in the morning, and you don't eat anything else after for at least 30 minutes. And this helps to oil the digestive tract because as we discussed already, vata tends towards dryness. So dryness in the GI tract, which can produce uh, constipation and dry bowel movements. So while you're oiling the skin, the internal body, you want to oil the external body. So you can do that through self-massage or self-abhyanga. Um, the use of traditional medicinal oils called tylums is preferred, which you can acquire on our site, hamsaapothecary.com. If you want to start this tonight and you're really excited, you can easily um, access untoasted sesame oil from your local grocery store and use untoasted sesame oil, which is basically safe for all the constitutional types. Another treatment that we use um, for treating excess vata is something called basti, or therapeutic herbal enemas. And this is kind of a more complex, um, longer discussion that I can't just you know tell you how to do in, in a few minutes. But we use Basti during my four-week detox program and where we do a 21-day guided cleanse and you learn um, to assess your body and your constitution and you also receive different types of therapeutic enemas that you can use at a home on a home measure. Um, during my four-week detox class, it's not mandatory. You don't have to do therapeutic enemas. If you feel resistance or it makes you feel uneasy, then you certainly don't have to do them. But it is one of the most effective ways um, to treat excess vata dosha. In fact, Ayurveda teaches that 80% of diseases can be treated via the colon using different types of therapeutic enemas. Next we have pitta dosha. And pitta is made up of the elements fire and water. 
Um, so in the physical body, Pitta governs all the, all the metabolism. Um, it has a strong relationship with digestion. If you think about how does fire function in nature, if you take a stick and you burn it, it turns and evaporates into gas. It changes form. So Pitta governs the principle of transmutation in the physical body. Um, it governs the hormonal system, digestion, and metabolism. And so when there's excesses of fire in the body, you're going to see heat-related symptoms of all kinds. Um, the person's going to crave being cold. A bata and a pitta walk into a room. The bata is like, it's really cold in here. The pitta is saying, it's really hot. The bata is saying, turn off the fan. The movement is driving me nuts. The pitta is like, we need circulation in here. Turn the fan on. Um, there's inflammation in the body of all kinds. Tendinitis is a common symptom associated with excess pitta. Inflammatory conditions on the, the skin, like acne, rosacea, and psoriasis. Loose bowel movements, which are a symptom of really quick digestion. Um, and anger, criticism, and irritability are also symptoms of excess heat in the mind, so fiery type emotions. One of the best things that we can do to treat excess pitta dosha are favoring blood cleansers. The blood, the liver, and the small intestine are all of excess pitta's Achilles tendons in the body. And whenever there is like acne or rosacea or psoriasis, we always look at liver function and we work to cleanse the, um, the liver. So how can we do that? Include leafy greens in your diet. Right now we have mustard greens in the market, which are really, really bitter. And it's your bitters that tend to be very cleansing, cleansing and detoxifying for pitta dosha. Um, Swiss chard, kale, those are all good. Turmeric, great spice to have on hand as a staple for your pitta types. And then you could also make a tea, a blood cleanser tea to have always in your refrigerator at all times and drink at room temperature. Um, it's made of 50% burdock root and 50% dandelion. And take a tablespoon of your 50-50 mix and bring it to simmer in about four cups of hot water, boiling water, and strain it and then drink it throughout the day. In our My Four Week Detox class with a 21 day guided cleanse, um, we use a method called Varechna. And Varechna is a, a cleansing method that specifically addresses the small intestine and the liver um, through an herbal regimen and then um, a laxative that you use. Castor oil is one of the most common ones, but there are also different types of herbal laxatives that we use to create a flushing effect in the liver and the gallbladder. It's a really effective um, method for cleansing the blood. Finally, we have kapha dosha, and kapha is earth and water. Unlike vata, which is the sort of ethereal, subtle, you don't, can't really see it, but you know it's there because you can see what it's doing something. Kapha is very opposite. There's matter, there's density. You can really see kapha. We can see the earth, we can see the rocks, we can see the mud, we can see the soil, the rocks, and the mountains, etc. Same thing in the physical body. Kapha is our structure. It houses the other doshas. It's everything sticky and slimy. It's our mucus our synovial fluid, our um, plasma in the body. It's the, the, um, the saliva in our mouth. It's the actual uh, mucus lining on the stomach, etc. So when there's excess earth and water or excess kapha, you're going to see excess mucus production. You'll see allergies, um, mucus in the sinuses. You may see swelling, tendencies towards water retention, excess weight, in the mind and the emotional body, when there's excess kapha, grief, depression, tendencies toward melancholy, hoarding, resentment, holding on of all kinds. Uh, the bowels are also a good giveaway if there's excess kapha. If they're very sticky, it, it sticks to the toilet, it comes out formless. Or if there's mucus production in the bowel, that indicates that there's excess kapha dosha. How do we treat excess kapha? Some of the best ways to treat excess kapha is through fasting, so through calorie deprivation, which Ayurveda teaches in increases heat in the body, which stimulates digestive agni. Um, also through favoring pungent spices. So pungent spices include the spices that inc increase heat in the mouth. It triggers the trigeminal nerve in the face and creates a feeling of heat. So your cayenne pepper, raw onion, 
raw garlic are all considered to be pungent in space, uh, in spice, in taste, excuse me. <laughs> um, a spice water that you can easily implement into your daily regimen for excess kapha is called ama pachana water. And um, it's two slices of raw ginger, three fresh basil leaves that have been chopped, and two peppercorns covered with four cups of hot water. Strain it after 15 minutes and you can sip it throughout the day. In my four week detox class with a 21 day guided cleanse, you learn about the daily lifestyle practices to reduce excess kapha dosha, and you have the option of partaking in different fasting methods, which there are several different fasting methods to choose from that graduate from easy to intense. And so depending on your comfort level, you can choose which fasting method suits you at this time um, to reduce excess kapha and to strengthen your digestion. I also want to talk about ama. So we've talked about what happens when the dosha rises in the body, and those are treated through specific methods. Um, a lot of excess dosha um, practices are, are more of like the lifestyle practices um, to use on an ongoing basis, but there's also a distinction between ama. And ama basically refers to the undigested matter that is left in the, the body and the mind. It's, it's, it's described as being sticky and gooey and lodges places and creates all sorts of um, havoc. And so it's different than excess dosha. Excess dosha, we mostly treat through lifestyle practices. Excess ama or toxins, we use the stronger purgative measures. And the strongest, stronger purgative measures include the, the basti, so the therapeutic enemas, the laxatives, and the fasting methods. And you learn um, about how to make those distinct, distinctions in my four-week detox class and 21-day guided cleanse. And you learn how to, uh, how to treat that and this kind of goes into my next um, thing that I want to talk about what distinguishes Ayurvedic cleanse methods from many of the other programs out there are that there are these universal cleanse practices that we do on a daily basis. So again, there are universal diet cleansing practices we do every day, um, ideally during the morning period. And then there are these intense detox methods that we reserve for specific times of the year especially for the fall season and the spring season. But the universal cleanse practices that, that we all should be doing on a daily basis include um, a, a really strong morning routine. Um, tongue scraping, so we scrape the uh, toxic residue that's accumulated in the mouth while we were sleeping with a tongue scraper. Drinking a glass of room temperature water first thing in the morning to help flush the lymphatic system. Meditation practice to increase our ability to observe ourselves and our tendencies, as well as empower the inner knower and the inner guide. Uh, dry skin brushing, I have directions uh, on my blog. I also have a video on YouTube if you want to refer to either of those. But you use a dry skin brush to manually stimulate lymphatic flow in the body. And self-massage, which we also talked about earlier, which is the application of medicinal oils. My four-week cleanse class starts um, every month online, and we also have it available in person during the fall season and the spring season at my Hamsa Center, which is in Chicago. For Chicago residents that want to take the cl class in person, you have access to both the online program as well as the program here, which is great. If you ever have to miss a class, you can access the information at your leisure. For people that are taking the class online, this is a four-week class with a 21-day guided cleanse. The guided cleanse um, focuses on the different doshic types, so each week has a different theme. We begin with pitta dosha during the first week, then it's kapha dosha, and the last week is vata dosha. You learn about the toxins associated with each of the doshic types. You learn about lifestyle practices, as well as the stronger purgative methods and you have the option of using the stronger purgative methods or not, depending on your comfort level and the depth to which you want to cleanse. You have access to an online portal that includes your weekly video as well as a downloadable PDF of recipes and explicit directions on what it is that you're going to be doing for the week ahead. And then you have access to a closed um, Facebook page, which I manage to answer questions, et cetera, that you post there. And then each week we do a call. So there's a call 
where you can submit your questions via email ahead of time in the call, and I simply answer all the questions. And the question, the weekly call is 90 minutes long. Thank you so much for joining me uh, today on my uh, presentation on my favorite Ayurvedic cleanse methods. You'll be receiving a um, downloadable three-day complimentary cleanse so you can get a better idea of what Ayurvedic cleansing is and do a three-day cleanse if you'd like to at the conclusion of this video. Thank you so much for your time today. I know that 45 minutes is a, a lot to give and I really appreciate you joining me. So I hope that this information aids you.